Job growth in the U.S. is picking back up as pandemic restrictions ease and COVID-19 vaccinations continue. The Labor Department's latest report shows the country added 559,000 jobs last month and unemployment fell to 5.8 percent. This comes after April's jobs numbers caught some economists and the White House by surprise, with the report falling short of expectations. To break down the numbers now, let's bring in Director of Portfolio Strategy at Optimal Capital, Francis Stacy, who we have not seen in a really yeah, long time. So good it's to really see good you, to Francis. Talk to you, Francis. Hey, guys. So <laughs> um, nice all right, to so, see you. Hey. So, and, and, and it sounds like we have something sort of good to talk about. Um, how did May's job numbers fare compared to what economists were expecting? And what does this data tell us about the state of the economy? Well, this is the perfect number for all involved, because if this number would have been a million, uh, I think markets would have sold off quite tremendously thinking, oh, the Fed's going to have to taper sooner rather than later. I mean, if you think about it, we're still down 7.4 million jobs or, you know, between that and 8 million jobs. So the thing about it is, is that if you add a million jobs every month, and that's only eight months before the Fed reaches its, you know, substantial forward progress, which is the language around when it's going to taper. And we know that this, these markets have gone up, 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 because of all of the money that's been put into the system to compensate for COVID. So the fact that this was not, it was substantially better than last month, means that we're headed in the right direction, but we're not headed in the right direction so quickly that it's going to cause displacement in the markets. Now, some people say, who cares about the markets? What about the people out there who need the jobs? I agree with that sentiment, but if you have rapid displacement in the markets, that's going to affect the hiring sentiment because these things are all connected. So uh, what factors, Francis, played into the numbers that we're seeing right now? Well, uh, I think that there is an increase in wages because I think there are some labor shortages. It's hard to find employees. Now, is that because people can't go to the workplace because of COVID factors or child care factors? Is it because the unemployment benefits are outpacing what they would get for their lower wage jobs? It's really hard to say. And I'm glad that this is being focused on from a state level rather than a federal level as far as these unemployment benefits go, because you're going to leave less people behind because the states are so different, as we know. Um, but these things are, you know, increase. The, there's an increase in demand, and the labor can't quite keep up, which is stilting the economy's recovery just a little bit. But what's beneficial about this is that it's not rising so quickly that the Fed gets ahead of itself tightening, because if the Fed tightens too quickly, then you're going to slow the progress that we have coming, you know, the recovery that's in place. So what is the labor market's progress expected to look like as we head further into the summer? Personally, I hope it continues at this pace, slow and steady, um, because I think that that pushes that conversation of getting back to pre-COVID labor and the Fed, you know, potentially tightening off 16 or so months, which I think the markets can digest. And it gives time for, you know, these supply chain issues and this demand to kind of regulate. If we look at why the Fed is saying what they're saying uh, about inflation being transitory, it's because there are some, you know, fits and starts with the economy starting back up again in those supply chains. And as those normalize and we get the labor back in and the demand normalizes, what we want is we want to have these ratios become a little bit more consistent because there's less likelihood to make a mistake on policy. So there are a lot of actually, even though people are screaming about inflation right now, there are deflationary, potentially deflationary pressures coming to the system in the back half of the year. So if you look at inflation and deflation as a seesaw, you know, it's up and to the right. Inflation is just sky high right now. But as you have deflationary pressures, a slowing in fiscal spending, uh, potentially the, you know, uptick in corporate taxes is a little bit of a deflationary pressure. And you have, you know, potential problems in mortgage markets and credit markets coming in to the system, you know, that seesaw is going to balance out a little bit more. And these numbers coming in slow and steady at half a million-ish a month are going to keep policymakers and market participants from overreacting. Francis, uh, let me ask you a question about consumer sentiment right now. What are you seeing uh, across the United States? One of the things, and Emory and I were talking about this yesterday, that I found sort of remarkable is we thought throughout the pandemic, because many people found themselves out of work, 
uh, that we would see a drop in prices for, for example, luxury items. Um, but what I've seen over the course of the last six months especially is an increasing rise in, in things that are nice-to-haves. Um, and and I, we're even starting to see now, as you know, vacation bookings are sky high. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, people And people are not just going, like, to the Poconos, I mean, which is a wonderful, lovely place. But people are going all out with big, fancy vacations. So I'm just curious. Um, the doomsayers said that, you know, consumer sentiment in the consumer market was going to drop. But I, it feels like it's really stronger than ever. Right. So if I look at that from the mechanical perspective, you had people paying off a lot of debt during the pandemic who were able to work and then spent a lot less because staying at home, you tend to spend less. Um, and then you had people you had, a, you know, a rapid increase in savings. So people have money you know, to burn in their savings. You also, for those who were lucky enough to participate in the market action, they you had a rapid increase in their wealth and people who sold homes at these higher prices. So you have uh, people ready to spend and that consumer demand is there. Now, from the pricing standpoint, why are prices going up? There are a couple factors. Number one, the input costs are going up because you know, food costs, raw materials, all of those things have skyrocketed in the last several months and, you know, started being priced into the markets in November when we had the vaccine announcement. So those input costs are going up and companies don't want those to hit their balance sheets, particularly if they're publicly traded, because then that means the company's weaker and the, so the stock is going to sell off. So they pass those prices to the best of their ability on to the consumer. So you've got this price, these prices going up. But people got a little bit wealthier in some cases during the pandemic. Of course, we know that's not everyone. And so this is the dynamic that you're seeing. But I think that there's also um, a psychological component that is absolutely huge. I mean, you know, we can't remember a time in history where we were locked at home and we physically couldn't go anywhere. And if we tried to go somewhere, it wasn't open. Or in some places we had curfews and we just had so much restriction on life. And I think that, you know, in America, we love freedom of choice and we like to be able to move around and go places. And so I think people are having a psychological reaction of, oh, my God, I've been locked in my house for a year. Let me out of jail, please. All right. Francis, Stacy, thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Nice to see you. Yeah, great to see you. Nice to see you, too.